another minute just letting everybody come in. We had used the waiting room function. And that just takes a minute for everyone to get there. Meanwhile, I'll rearrange all the things on my screen. Hi, Jerry, nice to see you. It's okay, you don't have to answer. <laughs> That's even better. Good, a good wave. Thank you. All right, so we're, uh, we're about halfway to the sign-in list. So I'll just start talking, which is what I'm good at. And uh, welcome everybody. You've joined ISBM and our jam session, the first one of 2021. So glad you could join us. And especially for those of you that are members, if you're not, we're gonna tell you a little bit about ISBM. Today, we're gonna to hear from Professor George Day. And uh, George has been leading the edge of improving marketing and marketing excellence in companies for a very long time. His uh, work back in 2020 was uh, one of those, 2020, <laughs> 20, 2000, 1999, 2000, um, was one of those things that drove uh, ISBM members to, to do this. Okay, so I'm gonna click forward if I can, or maybe not, there we go. So we were founded in 1982 back at Penn State. Um, there were a few companies and researchers in the B2B space that got together and said, you know, we need to do some more work in this. 65% of marketing is really B2B marketing and so little research is done in that area. So today we're about 40 member firms strong. We have 29 academic fellows and two new ones that were just named. We'll be announcing those in a few months and a whole bunch of instructors and partners that help our member companies. Today, as I mentioned, you're gonna hear from George Day. That's him on the left there. And I'm Lynn Yenyo. I'm the executive director of ISBM who um, with my partner, Rand Mendez, which I'm sure you know, again, if you're a member, um, run the members side of ISBM. Here's how we'll work this today. So uh, if, you've, if you've been in Zoom, you'll recognize the tools. And if you've been in something like this, it's very similar. Everyone is in a meeting today, so everyone could chat, but we'd prefer if you turn your cameras and your microphones off to save us bandwidth. And if you have a question at any time during the presentation, please type it into the chat window. You can chat to everyone and we'll all see that, or you can just ch chat to Lynn Yanyo, and then I'll see your chat and I will be posing the questions to George as they come through and as it makes sense. If you have other concerns or something's not working, feel free to chat to us there too, and we'll take care of that. Um, if you want to raise your hand or some other things, again, we'll, we're, uh, Lori and I are behind the scenes paying attention while George is talking. And there's always the question of how do I get this later? So as always, we record these presentations and the recording will be available 28, 40, 24, 48 hours after our presentation on our website, isbm.com in the library. And then after 30 days, it'll move to B2B Pulse, which is um, accessible if you're a member. If you're a member and you don't know about B2B Pulse, please reach out to Lori or I and we'll help you get registered in there so you can see all of those previous recordings. Here's our leadership team, minus Scott Israelson, who just joined us. Um, so Lynn and Rand and Becky, uh, try to keep things going and get everything organized for you. Um, Stefan is uh, part of ISBM on the academic side and he manages all of the academic uh, directions for the, the education they do for students there and the research that they direct. Lori Licolini basically does everything and we just all ask her for everything to do that. Ralph Oliva is our immediate past predecessor. So um, you'll, if you've been with us for a while, you remember Ralph, but he's still active and with us in support. And Gary Lillian was the immediate predecessor for Stefan, and he's still helpful with us. We have a, a large number of fellows. George is also one of those, and he's speaking to us today. And uh, if you feel as a member, you, you would benefit from talking to a few of these folks who really know their areas well, let us know. We'll be happy to help you. We have a lot of member firms. If you are interested in talking to the member firms, we'd be happy to help you get introductions to each other. And uh, coming up, 
uh, just to get them on your calendar, you'll want to block out May 18 and 19. It's our next member meeting. We're hosting that jointly with the Sales Excellence Institute from the University of Houston. We'll be talking about how things are transformed now past COVID with all the experience we've had of doing things remotely for marketing and sales, working together and in their own areas. You really won't want to miss it. And if that isn't enough, um, on the evening of May 18th, we're doing a chocolate tasting. You can only participate in the chocolate tasting if you register early enough and you'll have to provide your address so I can send you the chocolate tasting stuff. So no, no cost for that. You do have to be a member, um, but if you register like two days before the event, I'm sorry, I won't be able to get the chocolate to you. So you'll wanna register early. Also coming up, um, and I'll talk about a little bit later, is the ISBM B2B Mastery Track. Those courses start next month. And uh, we also have uh, getting new products to market faster, better, and more agile with Bob Cooper teaching that in April as a separate course to sign up for. And again, as always, everything in our library is ready to go. Okay, so let me do a little introduction. George can talk about himself more, but um, George is Emeritus Professor and one of our fellows from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, as I mentioned, George has been doing uh, research in these areas for decades. He has many, many books. Um, and the first ones that uh, I remember reading were from the early 2000s on marketing excellence. He continues this conversation uh, today with his newest book, which I'll let him talk about. Um, it's a great read. You'll want to pick it up, perhaps, when you're done here. Um, and what I'll remind everybody as I let George take over from here is that if you have a question, please type it to us in the chat room. Um, and uh, assuming that everybody's things are working, because it looks like Lori's taking care of everybody that's having a challenge, I'm going to stop sharing, George, and I'm going to let you take over from here. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, I am really, really delighted to be here. And I'll be even more delighted if I can get this to work. And here we are. Um, so it is a great pleasure uh, to, to be back with ISBM again. I've had uh, long, long relationships with them. I've worked with them, a great respect for the work that is done. And uh, it's extremely important uh, as a thought leading organization. Uh, uh, Gary, Lillian and I particularly go back a long way and uh, it's always a treat to be with him and uh, get his challenging questions, which uh, I expect from all of you. Uh, and, and indeed, I'm looking forward very much to working with you. The emphasis here is on the working with. So this will be valuable as a session to the extent that it helps you deliver the, the kinds of customer value and shareholder value that is expected from by you uh, and, and, and from your organization. And so what I'm gonna do is talk about the, uh, how this book uh, leveraged itself into a way of thinking about preparing for what's coming after the pandemic. And uh, so I, I think we're all cautiously optimistic about, uh, uh, emerging from the pandemic. And the leading firms are already looking over the horizon to say, how can we prepare ourselves even better? Now, uh, what we have learned uh, about preparation is uh, firstly coming uh, from our book uh, called See Sooner, Act Faster, we uh, discovered there's a category of organizations that we call vigilant organizations. And uh, they were the ones that we focused on uh, in, in, in trying to understand who was leading digital turbulence. Uh, and and I, by turbulence, I mean uh, highly unpredictable, uncertain, and difficult environments. But there were certain firms that really thrived in, in that kind of turbulence. And it, it turns out that these vigilant organizations were much better at uh, um, emerging from the pandemic. They were better able to profit from the uncertainty 
created by the, the pandemic because they were more resilient. They had leadership teams that were uh, always thinking ahead of the rivals. And uh, now in, in looking ahead, uh, these same vigilant firms are asking the question, what's coming to us next? Well, that is a question that's, of course, shrouded by uncertainty, but there are certain attributes of these organizations that equip them really well to uh, be ready for whatever comes. And uh, that's what I'm gonna talk about. I'll particularly focus on the role of marketing as a general management responsibility and marketing as a functional activity and how it uh, uh, particularly supports and strengthens vigilance. So what I mean by turbulence was actually defined earlier by uh, Peter Drucker. And uh, he talked about it as irregular, nonlinear, erratic, but, but it can be managed. And that's what we're gonna be talking about. So, uh, I view, and, and uh, in, in conjunction with my colleague, Paul Schumacher, whom I've worked with on this for now 15 years, uh, we define vigilance as a collective capability. Uh, it requires curiosity, candor, and especially foresight. And, and we'll talk a lot about how to invest in foresight. Uh, but the, key lessons are that uh, you need a committed leadership team and an engaged marketing organization. And that's uh, building on Lynn's earlier observation about marketing excellence. Um, and uh, so excellent marketing organizations are those that really can lead the organization into the future. Uh, our core message is that by seeing sooner, that is by seeing sooner, I mean detecting the weak signals of threats and opportunities, understanding them better, and then being prepared uh, when the time is right. And we'll, we'll talk a lot about how they make preparations, how they're ready to grab opportunities or to parry threats when the, the, the time is right. Uh, because uh, you don't want to be too early to the party. Uh, so I'm going to work through four different topics. They all build on each other. And uh, I'm going to say a little bit about the need for vigilance, just to underline with some examples, what is best practice and why it uh, pays out so handsomely. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, what we've learned in the course of <clears throat> literally studying 480 organizations um, in, in uh, survey format, but we've worked with leadership teams in about another 25 uh, organizations to define what uh, separates the vigilant from the vulnerable organizations. And, and uh, just to give you a rough sense, there's only about 15 to 20% of all of the global organizations that we have studied that could be characterized as vigilant. Uh, about 25% <clears throat> are vulnerable and they're always on their back foot. They're always being surprised and scurrying to catch up. They're reacting. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> the, the third topic is, all right, what do you do to improve vigilance? And there I'm going to build on the work that ISBM has done on capabilities. I, I hope you've taken their capability audit uh, because that's essential to building the preparedness that we're, we're talking about. So there'll be a lot of discussion about capabilities and uh, particularly topic four will be the priorities for you as marketing 
leaders in your organization. So that's the agenda. It's very a la carte. Uh, your questions will shape which way we go. But uh, I do reserve the uh, opportunity, or if you like, the privilege to cold call. And uh, so uh, uh, be prepared, as they say. Uh, here are some examples of uh, vigilant organizations. I'll talk about each of these. They're all clients of mine uh, <coughs> that uh, uh, I'll particularly talk about uh, Sonoma County wine growers uh, and, and, and show you uh, what they did. Uh, some of the others I can't speak too deeply because of uh, the, the, the client privileges. But I can say uh, quite a bit about Adobe that's in the public record. And I, I think this will give you a sense of how preparedness pays off in the future. In uh, <clears throat> about 19, uh, sorry, about uh, 2009 or 10, they looked ahead and they could see that uh, cloud computing would be having a transformative effect on their core Photoshop product. Now, those of you that have used Photoshop over many years, you remember back in the, uh, the launch era, they sold Photoshop uh, as shrink wrapped package software. You loaded it into your PC and off you went. It was your program. Now, people were extremely loyal to it, has great capabilities, but uh, in, 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 in looking ahead, and the CMO of uh, uh, Adobe played a uh, very pivotal role <clears throat> in uh, guiding this transition towards a cloud-based subscription service. So they, they, they tested carefully, uh, but what motivated them was uh, two things. They could see that they could deliver much more functionality in their Photoshop product. And what they really were sweating about was the likelihood that cloud uh, computing capabilities would enable any number of competitors to get into their business. Uh, they were worried about Microsoft, even Oracle, uh, they sensed was sniffing around that area. So they uh, took uh, the, uh, the initiative, they moved faster because they knew the space and they could see the competitors coming and they moved into the subscription model in uh, 2000 and uh, 13, 14, after doing a uh, major experiment in Australia. Uh, so fast forward, the uh, initial uh, negative reaction, interestingly, for some of their loyal customers, completely switched as they could see the benefits of it. But now uh, they are among the most profitable of all tech firms. The last time I looked, their price earnings ratio was 85 to one, and they had tripled their revenues. So by seeing sooner, they were able to act faster. And the, the faster reference is really framing it against the rivals. And uh, so they made some very fundamental strategic books, deeply informed by insights into competition, how channels were gonna behave. And uh, of course, uh, it was a very customer centric move. Uh, these others I will uh, return to later on. And I've got some uh, lessons that I'm gonna share just to set the stage uh, based upon the last uh, literally 15 years of uh, research, consulting, and uh, I, I've given uh, uh, many, many seminars and I'm delighted to be able to share our, our thinking with you today. 
Uh, so I, I think Jack Welsh uh, set the, uh, the, the tone and uh, leaders, particularly marketing leaders, must develop a sixth sense, an ability to see around the corner or over the horizon, however you want to frame the metaphor. Uh, but what we've learned is that the vigilant organizations start with the tone at the top their leadership teams, and, and that's going to be the, uh, uh, the, the focal point, is the C-suite, or in the division, it would be the direct reports to the general manager. They're deeply curious, and uh, uh, I just learned, uh, interestingly, that uh, Amazon, uh, just two years ago, built curiosity and learning into their principles for operation. They're really open to diverse inputs. And uh, something I'll talk a lot about, which is very much a marketing responsibility, is taking an outside-in view of their strategy making. And we'll, we'll talk more about that, but uh, uh, you're, you're familiar with the term, uh, but our particular use of it here is to start the whole strategy formulation process by standing in the shoes of your customers, rivals, channel partners, and looking at your company from their vantage point and, and, and thinking about what they see uh, objectively, uh, how they compare you to your rivals, what their needs are, how their capabilities are changing. And, and so you identify first with your uh, key uh, external players and only then uh, and, and do you adopt uh, an inside out perspective. You say, okay, what resources do we got? What are our current capabilities? How do we best exercise them? And how do we use uh, emerging technologies? Those are crucial questions, but they have to be framed and, and uh, set in a very broad context. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a lot about how to go about doing that. We also found that uh, the leadership team and how they allocate their uh, scarce attention resources uh, was crucial. Uh, just to give you a sense, the vigilant organizations would spend as much of their leadership team time talking about what's going to happen in the future. Uh, whereas vulnerable organizations, uh, when the leadership team got together, was very much about uh, current performance, executing against plan, uh, immediate resource and budgeting considerations, very short term. And uh, then they would get surprised and have to uh, be forced to react. George, <laughs> hey, George, hey, George, could I interrupt you on that oh, point? Absolutely. I just find that uh, fascinating insight. And you know, in my experience in many years of being in a corporate environment, you know, I spent a tremendous amount of time reporting on the last month and the last quarter and yep. comparing current against last year. And almost no time did I spend, um, maybe at the end of the year as we were putting the plan together for the next year, thinking mm -hmm. about the future. So help me out with that. When you say they spend far more time thinking about the future, like what percentage do you see? Is you know I would have said maybe I spent 20% of my time at best on, on the future look. Is that? Um, yeah. So it, it, it depends on the industry, of course how dynamic and how volatile it is. But uh, the Institute for the Future did a corroborating study uh, of this question. And they found that when the leadership team got together and uh, what we would call a vigilant organization spent as much as 50 to 60% of their time thinking about the future. Now that could be... Uh, in, in, in any number of ways, they could be thinking about uh, where future opportunities are, what threats are coming over the horizon, 
But I would argue that uh, thinking about uh, where we're going to get the necessary talent, uh, uh, if you if you want to go into heavily into AI or blockchains as a key ingredient of your strategy, uh, then you've got to be thinking really uh, far out as to how to get the talent necessary to support that. So there's many dimensions to thinking about the future, but the way you framed it is what we see in vulnerable organizations. And uh, one of the things I'm gonna to turn to very quickly is uh, how much difference it makes in performance. But uh, roughly 50% for the vigilant uh, organizations, which in our uh, estimation is about 15 to 20% of all of the players in an industry. Uh, the vulnerable uh, are about 30 to 35%, and they're spending about 20% of their time thinking about their future. Uh, now, uh, the, the, the tricky part of asking that question is, how much time does a vulnerable organization spend in the here and now crisis management because they weren't prepared. Uh, but oh, that that really the resonates. Answer, the the yeah, answer to right? that. Yes, right. Spend because if you're in crisis mode, you don't have time to look up. Yeah, yeah. that's that's a very good question. We, we so, had another question that came in too. Is oh yeah. Is there a link? I love the questions. Yeah. So keep there, them coming. Okay. Is there a link between having um, a strategic or market intelligence function and being a vigilant organization? Yes. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, later, uh, so this is, uh, this is your incentive for hanging in. I'll be talking about uh, what we've learned about investments in foresight and uh, certainly uh, market insights, customer insights uh, functions are central to all of that. Uh, as well as uh, building a, uh, a, a broader insights function. So hang in there, we'll, we'll get to it. And I'll, I'll share some of the, uh, the when we get to the question of, okay, how do you uh, change and improve and become more vigilant? I'll, I'll develop that much further. But uh, one, of, one, of, one of the most interesting, uh, insights is seemingly uh, uh, simplistic, uh, but it, it turns out to be the, uh, the, the kernel of a lot of the change programs that uh, we are proposing. And, uh, and that is something that Andy Grove of Intel, the founder of Intel, first observed in that when firms are surprised, someone in the organization knew all about it uh, it, it, earlier, but uh, leadership didn't know they knew and they didn't know leadership needed to know. So that says a lot about coordination, information sharing and accountability. And that becomes very central to uh, uh, the characteristics of a vigilant organization. The uh, quite a bit of uh, our focus has been on uh, the, the ISBM uh, aspect of capabilities. And, and particularly, I'm going to uh, drill down into the dynamic sensing capability. Uh, because one of the things that uh, you're all suffering with uh, is information overload. The amount of weak signals coming at us is just overwhelming. Uh, so we need uh, sophisticated ways of uh, sorting out the, uh, the noise from the signal. And, and uh, by noise, I mean all the distracting, uh, uh, irrelevant material that uh, clogs our inbox. And uh, what we'll talk about is how asking good questions and uh, in, in insightful questions coming out of the, uh, the, the customer insight function, for example, will uh, help you narrow down what you pay attention to. Uh, 
Now I'm going to uh, share some data on just uh, how much benefit you get by being a vigilant organization. And uh, so uh, as you listen to this, I want you to consider some of the reasons why vigilant organizations are able to outperform their vulnerable rivals. Uh, so uh, let's, let's look at the data and, uh, oops. This, this comes from uh, a study that was started in 2008. Now, as I say, Paul Schumacher and I have been working on this for a long time. We built our instrument uh, initially in uh, 2005. Uh, some researchers in Europe uh, utilized it to uh, characterize uh, a, a sample of 85 multinational corporations uh, based in Europe that uh, we had, uh, they had to be publicly traded. And they used our uh, survey to firstly characterize the sample of 85 by whether they were high or low on their foresight capability, which is what we will now call uh, vigilance. And uh, they also uh, crossed it uh, with the need for vigilance, which was a function of, you know, how complex is their environment? These were mostly uh, global organizations. So they already had a lot of com uh, complexity. People like uh, Siemens or Sanofi uh, would, would be in this sample. The, Key takeaway is that uh, there were only a third of the organizations were characterized as vigilant, that has had really the capability they needed to deal with their complex environment. Uh, they found 48% were vulnerable. Uh, they came up with uh, uh, <laughs> an interesting group, which they characterized as neurotic, uh, that is spending more on uh, uh, vigilance and foresight than they really needed to. Uh, but that was, uh, remember, that was a judgment made in, uh, in, in, in 2008. Uh, and uh, what, what we see in the results is, uh, so, so the, the, the way they, uh, they, they measured the differences, oops. Sorry, I moved my banner. Hmm. You know, I've been finding uh, Zoom is, uh, okay. I just, I've, I've been learning a lot of different fixes for this problem. But I want you to concentrate on the fact that uh, vigilant organizations defined as vigilant in 2008, uh, then they track them for the next seven years. So it's a, a, uh, it's a defensible research design. It wasn't a cross-sectional, it was a time series analysis where they found that uh, vigilant organizations were about twice as, sorry, of one third more profitable and uh, twice as uh, 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 effective at creating shareholder value. That is the, uh, the increase in market capitalization. Now these poor hapless neurotic organizations uh, and, and uh, they, they looked at them carefully and said, why are these people uh, uh, doing what they're doing? Uh, they're misallocating resources. And we see the result uh, is uh, a minus 4% increase, but they had a lot of other problems. But I wanna concentrate on uh, and get you uh, 
give me your thoughts on why vigilant organizations uh, outperform. So, uh, and, and, and I, I would love to hear you draw on your own experience, uh, given, given the framing of vigilance as being the first mover or the company that was best prepared in your industry. Why do you suppose uh, the, uh, the, the, there's such a difference in profitability and market cap increase? Uh, what, what are some of the paths to superior profitability? Anybody want to start? And feel free to open up your mic and just speak up, if, unless you'd rather type to the group. And as you recall, you know, George is a great educator and he uh, loves cold calling. So you could save everyone else by just reaching out for someone. Yeah, if I was in the classroom with you, I would walk over and look at you in the eye and say, you know, I know you know a lot about this. I want you to share it with your uh, fellow participants. So, uh, so Alan has said market share growth as an, as an answer. Yeah. Um, so market share is a, a, another outcome. Uh, so certainly they gain more market share that hence more profitability, but I want you to look underneath the, uh, the covers, if you like, as to why they were, uh, um, uh, more, more profitable, had greater market share. Those are outcome measures. What did they do differently that uh, set the stage for this superior performance, which is what you want to achieve and aspire to? I think, uh, I think vigilant organizations um, really understand their competition at a very deep level. Yep, absolutely. Um, and, and, and so they're understanding their, their competition and, and, and more broadly their customers. And so they're more resilient uh, when a competitor, for, for example, one of the uh, uh, great tools I think that vigilant organizations use very adroitly is red teaming. So they will red team, that is role play the uh, leaders of their biggest competitors. And uh, by role playing, they get a, they, they really stand outside of their own organizations. They get into the uh, uh, personas, the strategies of their biggest rivals. And uh, I first encountered this in uh, one of the founding members of ISBM, uh, DuPont. Uh, and uh, so it's widely used in the chemical industry, but some people use it better than others. And, and so uh, they understand their competitors and then they uh, uh, test run their uh, strategy changes against uh, the people that are role-playing the leaders of their rivals and uh, see what, the competitor might do when say we cut prices, change our distribution model, how will they likely react? So great, great insight, thank you. Any other reasons why vigilance pays out so handsomely? So Leslie has said uh, scenario planning. Absolutely. One of the key tools uh, in the, uh, the toolkit of a uh, vigilant organization. And in fact, uh, when, when we get to uh, the question of how do you go about building an organization and what kind of capabilities, we'll see that uh, a lot of it is to profit from uncertainty. And uh, scenario planning is the most effective tool for doing that. Yeah, great point. Uh, we also have uh, seeing new needs or opportunities ahead of the com competition. Absolutely. Yep. Identifying latent needs. Uh, uh, because uh, let me back up. 
by what I mean by latent needs. I see latent needs as uh, uh, the definition you really like is evident, but not yet obvious. In other words, <laughs> they're, they're not there uh, accessible. You've got to look for them. And uh, so a latent need of a customer uh, re requires some investigation, deep insight into their strategy, how they're viewing the world, and uh, then uh, seeing what kinds of needs will evolve and being ready with a, uh, a, an ability to serve those needs, uh, which, which uh, I, I think is a fundamental characteristic of good innovators, uh, effective innovators. Yep, this is good. Yep. You're on a roll. Another one. Uh, would it have um, something to do with these organizations in general being uh, have a strong having a strong market orientation or uh, or really valuing um, the function of, of strategic marketing? Absolutely. Uh, so the uh, the market orientation is uh, an element of what we call outside in thinking but it's probably the most uh, significant element b by uh, the, the reason we distinguish uh, market or customer orientation is we want to uh, look at uh, uh, the organization from the vantage point of every player in the ecosystem, every competitor, uh, or at least the, uh, the, the major competitors, but yeah, market orientation and uh, it's, uh, Kissing cousin, customer centricity, absolutely central to it, and and uh, th that suggests the uh, kind of belief system, the mental models uh, that you need to have, and, and even the organization. So, uh, outside-in thinking builds uh, substantially on the the work that ISBM and others have done on uh, market orientation. Yeah, great point. Um, we have folks talking about using some ethnographic research or observational research to get to new product development. Uh, so that's part of uh, literally uh, uh, what I again characterize as outside in thinking, the, uh, uh, or, or more generally the design approach or design thinking approach to innovation, uh, which is crucially driven by observation. You just, you, you don't come in with a preconception of what your customers need uh, and, and will require in the future. Rather, you just watch, uh, listen, and observe. So listen and learn is, is a great mantra. Uh, and um, I, I love uh, something I'd learned many years ago, uh, the, the distinction between listen to learn and listen to sell. And now, uh, uh, you, you've all seen salespeople who uh, just wait for the customer to finish so they can finish their pitch. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, so they're not really listening deeply for those latent needs. Rather, uh, they, they, they just want to, get through their pitch, close the sale. And uh, this, this goes back to the question about market orientation. Market-oriented firms are much better at listening and uh, than, than sharing the insights. So um, if your salespeople are out there uh, and they hear a customer has uh, a shift in strategy, uh, perhaps they're... Uh, launching a whole new line or using an AI enable uh, uh, algorithm to improve performance. Uh, and and they, they're not yet sure how it's going to play out. That is a, uh, an, an invitation to search more deeply into, okay, what do you mean? How can we uh, uh, better understand that? And of course the Unsaid question behind that is how can we best help you deal with this problem? Uh, but th that's half of it. The other half, which we find is uh, so crucial, 
is this notion of sharing uh, information. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to go back to Andy Grove, who uh, wrote a marvelous book called uh, uh, It's Healthy to be Paranoid. And uh, in there, he has a whole chapter on how he enables people way out on the periphery of the organization to send weak signals into the leadership team. And in fact, uh, he enabled uh, people as uh, way out in uh, the, the, the sales territories to reach him directly. He would give them their uh, his phone number, email address, uh, and invite them to share information about uh, uh, suspicious moves by competitors, for example. Um, so thank you. Yeah, this is this is good. We're, uh, we're, we're I think getting closer to uh, and, and filling out the uh, the picture of a vigilant organization. What else do you see going on? Uh, how that might account for? I mean, this is a uh, an enormous performance difference. How else might we explain it? Is there anything involved with the people that are hired to do this? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, th this goes back to <clears throat> the observation about how the leadership team spends its time. If they spend a lot of time thinking about talent, uh, uh, I, I remember uh, the, the, the first time I visited uh, Google's headquarters, uh, I was told about a room which no one could get into, uh, sort of like a sanctum sanctorum. And this was the room where the leadership team uh, kept all of the files and covered the walls with the talent they felt they wanted to hire. Now, they would uh, seldom, um, it, it, in uh, my understanding of Google's HR practices, they seldom hire from people that apply. Rather, they identify the kinds of people they want who are already leading uh, a, a function in uh, a respected rival, and they start to recruit them. So they search for the best talent. And uh, that's part of uh, the, the, their investment of time. So Google is uh, certainly uh, a, a far-sighted organization, which, which brings up one of the uh, techniques which is getting increasingly challenged. And that is uh, the propensity of Amazon, uh, Facebook, Google to hire, uh, sorry, to acquire embryonic competitors in order to get the talent. Uh, so they look uh, uh, and, and they're constantly scanning for uh, new technology startups, uh, new technologies, people who got licenses to, and, and, and uh, they will often acquire them. So now that's becoming uh, a, a major issue um, as, as we start to mount the hearings in the Senate and the House on the, the uh, anti-competitive practices of these big players. But that's certainly one part of it is they, they uh, slow down their rivals and uh, literally acquire uh, the, the, the kinds of capabilities they need. Cisco has been doing that for many, many years. And uh, so, this is part of, again, foresight, uh, scanning the horizon for new and uh, potentially uh, disruptive technologies or uh, competitively uh, threatening alternatives and uh, going out and uh, acquiring either a license or taking a, uh, a small stake in their ownership. So yeah, that's uh, that's critical. Uh, so one one final thing that uh, I want to revert to is the uh, 
the reason that Adobe is so effective, and that is they could see a looming threat and then they turned it into an opportunity. So uh, this is great. And uh, I really appreciate your inputs on this. Uh, so now we wanna to turn to the question of, okay, how do we go about doing this? What is it that distinguishes the vigilant from the vulnerable organizations? And uh, so uh, I'm gonna invite you to consider your organization uh, using this, this kind of scale at the top. So we have a, uh, a, a long instrument that we use with our clients to diagnose their, uh, whether they're vigilant or vulnerable, what we call high VQ or low VQ. But I wanna emphasize, this is a spectrum. So just to uh, frame it here, the high VQ uh, group is about 20%. The low VQ is uh, 30 to 35%. And then the rest are uh, spread in the middle. And uh, so the, the, the distinguishing factors. So we're, we're trying to get to the fundamental reasons why these organizations really outperform. And we see four, four factors. Uh, leadership commitment, investments in foresight, how they make strategy, and then how they coordinate and uh, create accountability. And, and so I've talked about many of these, but uh, you'll, you'll be able to uh, see uh, and, and contrast it. Um, so I won't go through all of these, but uh, certainly the leadership teams of vigilant organizations play a much longer game. They're much more uh, likely to uh, invest in, in foresight capabilities. They're, they really uh, encourage curiosity in the, uh, the organizations, uh, th throughout the organization. And in fact, uh, 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 the, by contrast, the vulnerable organizations show limited interest in anomalies. Now, there's a wonderful story about Alan Mulally uh, when he came from Boeing to be the CEO of Ford uh, many years ago, probably 14 years ago. And uh, he found in Ford an organization that uh, was uh, pretty rigid, uh, didn't share information, uh, they, they worked on the premise that knowledge was power, and they were losing ground in every one of their platforms, trucks, SUVs, uh, sedans, and, uh, uh, and what he discovered in his very first committee meeting, uh, sorry, very first meeting of his leadership team was that uh, everybody spent the previous week getting ready for their eight to 10 global leadership meeting. And uh, so they would work on their PowerPoints, uh, vet them, scrub them. And there were no surprises in these leadership meetings. It was a very much a focus on current performance against budget or uh, next generation product plans and that sort of thing. Uh, so after listening for about an hour, because he, uh, Alan Mulally, uh could see what was happening and he had already been alerted to it. He said, okay, I wanna take a time out here and uh, uh, <clears throat> I want this to be the last PowerPoint I ever see in our leadership team meeting uh, and shocked silence. Uh, apparently there were 16 people uh, in the meeting and uh, they had no idea what was, what was behind it because uh, that was their practice. They, they shared these PowerPoints on their current progress and effectiveness. Uh, what he said instead was, we're going to start every meeting by looking at and uh, 
questioning the anomalies we see. So by anomaly, I mean something out of the ordinary, something different, something surprising, something un unexpected. Your, your dealers are uh, uh, making demands that you've never seen before, or uh, the response of the customers to your latest uh, features was not at all what you expected, or a competitor is making a move and that would be, that was totally unexpected. So that would be what he would mean by an anomaly. And uh, so his, uh, he instantly changed the culture and the mindset of the organization by saying, I wanna spend the first 15 or 20 minutes of our two hour meeting uh, by looking at anomalies. Well, the, the first time he did this, uh, nobody uh, was prepared and one uh, person came up with an interesting anomaly uh, and uh, Alan Mullally celebrated that. The next meeting, uh, everybody in the meeting, the, the heads of uh, uh, the truck, bus, uh, auto lines here in, in, in uh, Europe, uh, sent their organizations to search for anomalies. And uh, that's what we mean by uh, exercising curiosity. Uh, so uh, anomalies uh, we'll, we'll see uh, are, are, are things that uh, uh, create and generate a, a curiosity. You know, let's, let's find out more about what's going on. Uh, the, the, the two other factors that uh, uh, I really want to uh, spend time on here are investments in foresight, which uh, includes uh, the, the point about uh, scenario thinking, uh, because uh, it requires discipline, wide angle scanning, as opposed to reactive uh, approaches and, uh, and, and, and buying a lot of real options. Uh, one that I find is a real litmus test of uh, a vigilant organization uh, and, and it, such a contrast with a vulnerable organization is that uh, in, in vigilant organizations, they, they have a, a lot of innovation disappointments, which is a term that 3M uses. They, they don't talk about failures anymore. They talk about disappointments. Well, it didn't live up to our expectations. Uh, it may have failed dramatically, but they say, this is an opportunity to learn. And uh, one of the things that 3M has learned from this analysis of disappointments is that uh, almost every one of their most successful new products, new services has come from a diagnosis of a disappointment and uh, a, a redoubled effort to overcome the limitations. Whereas in uh, vulnerable organizations, they see a failure as an error. And uh, so we, we can see that the culture of vulnerable organizations is uh, reactive uh, and uh, it's a play it safe kind of uh, uh, culture or mindset. One of the things that <clears throat> really distinguishes uh, vulnerable organizations is that they only focus on <clears throat> what I'll call ordinary capabilities. That's the, the term uh, in uh, strategic management. <clears throat> Whereas uh, uh, the, the, the vigilant organizations are all about dynamic capabilities. Uh, finally, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, the outside in approach and uh, how they make strategy, embracing uncertainty uh, through uh, scenario planning is a critical part of the st st strategy making process. So they, they, they uh, see uncertainty as a necessary aspect of their environment. It's going to increase and they embrace it.
uh, as, and, and, and they embrace it particularly with scenario planning. And lastly, they coordinate, they share information very effectively. So uh, I wanna give you this sense of, there's a lot on this chart uh, and, and how we will use it to both position the marketing organization within these sets of fundamental factors and uh, then how we actually go about improving vigilance. So uh, let, let me stop here and uh, uh, see if there's any questions uh, because I, I think this is a situation where questions are very revealing and I really uh, would, would, would greatly value. That's what I learned from uh, is my clients, uh, particularly asking me questions that uh, uh, re require me to stand back, reflect, and uh, uh, dig deep into the essence of this model. So love to get your questions. Any, uh, any thoughts, reactions? We have one. Um, so say a company is trying to improve their product development and product launch process. Yeah. Are there specific pieces of this that they can focus on initially since they can't change everything? Uh, so this is, uh, <clears throat> let's take the right-hand side, the uh, vigilant organizations. They, they approach innovation uh, in, a, in a very different way. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so particularly in their foresight capabilities, they do much wider angle scanning. So they, they, they look for uh, uh, emerging technologies. So these were the companies that were looking at blockchains five or six years ago before the uh, technology was really uh, uh, perfected and we could see its potential. Uh, uh, then they would, uh, uh, back to the innovation part, uh, buy real options. They would do experiments. They'd buy small uh, uh, startup or a stake in a small startup. And uh, this is the, uh, the, the essence of design thinking. They would uh, listen, observe, and uh, uh, re really capture emerging latent needs from their customers. So the, these are companies that are extremely curious and they want the whole organization to be curious about customers and competitors and channel partners and, and share that information and then use it as a jumping off point for uh, more audacious and earlier innovations. I, I hope that answers your question. I, I, I circled around it uh, in a lot of different ways. Does that help? Thank you, yes. Um, for, for an organization whose focus is market, making the quarter at all costs, um, how do marketers find resources that, to be able to raise the awareness and get the help if, that's, if they're struggling with day-to-day? -day? Oh, that's a great question. <clears throat> so uh, I'll talk more about what I envision as the, uh, the role of marketing in the future, but uh, uh, marketing is the interface with uh, the, the external environment, uh, less so the investing environment, but uh, certainly the uh, competitive and uh, customer uh, environment, they have to be the eyes and ears of the organization. And uh, their, their credibility uh, depends upon having deep insights into what is coming uh, what, what, what kinds of uh, competitive moves and uh, customer requirements are going to be coming at them in the future. And uh, so it doesn't take a lot of budget, as it turns out, uh, but it, it requires a different uh, frame of mind. Uh, and, and, and so I don't find that uh, it's, it's so much a budget issue as it's a uh, kind of a mindset uh, or mental model uh, and uh, a cultural aspect uh, that nurtures curiosity. 
And uh, uh, I, I find also, as, as I call out uh, here, that uh, they think differently and uh, they're willing to reach out to uh, identify the critical assumptions and uh, challenge them. So I, I don't think it's a budget issue mm -hmm. as much as it is a mental model or a uh, mindset question. Great. But you'll, you'll see a lot more about this. Uh, but I, I uh, am mindful of that uh, there, there's a good deal to cover and, and I really want to get to the role of marketing in, in much more uh, detail. But uh, this is the broad framing that explains why companies like Nike, Adobe, um, and um, others are really ahead of the game. Okay, any other questions? I don't see any. All right, now let's talk about uh, uh, <clears throat> the difference between ordinary capabilities and dynamic capabilities, because that'll be central to what marketing does. Um, <clears throat> And, and ordinary uh, is not my term, but uh, it's, it's grown up in the strategic management literature, but it means uh, the efficient use of existing processes and resources, absolutely crucial. And uh, so we have to celebrate our prowess in supply chain management or pricing, uh, sales support, because uh, if you can do those better and the environment is reasonably stable, you're gonna way outperform your rivals. Uh, but in a turbulent environment, and now I'm gonna to turn to the, the, uh, the thrust of this session, these do not necessarily prepare you for greater turbulence and uh, new opportunities coming at you very fast, technology changing fast. Uh, <clears throat> let's look at supply chain management. Uh, for the companies that treated it as a, an optimization question, that is, let's uh, cut down inventories um, dramatically, just in time management, and uh, we can really optimize this thing for um, e efficiency and uh, short-term cost reductions. And that's great. But what, we, what did we discover in uh, March, April, and May? That most supply chains were very brittle. That is, they, they couldn't flex fast. Uh, and they, they didn't have a lot of resilience. There was not enough buffers in them. Uh, there were lack of visibility into uh, the uh, upstream partners uh, and sources. And, and so a lot of companies struggled mightily in uh, the um, aftermath of the pandemic, uh, particularly over the summer, in, in trying to uh, get their supply chains together. And uh, we still see in the area of rare earths, uh, and particularly semiconductor chips, uh, what has uh, uh, befallen the auto industry in uh, their, their chip shortages? They're, they're looking at, even now, uh, a year later, they uh, probably have to reduce output of their vehicles by up to 20% because they can't get the semiconductor chips. Uh, and, and that's because they're relying on one extremely low cost producer in Taiwan. So I use that as an example of, uh, of a brittle supply chain, uh, which was optimized for a certain uh, predictable environment. <clears throat> what I'm gonna be talking about here is the need to augment these ordinary capabilities with uh, dynamic capabilities which is the sensing of opportunities. And, and that goes back to the question of how do we find opportunities faster? Uh, 
seize them more effectively, and then transform the organization. So let's look at the, uh, the sensing capability um, and, and how that might uh, play out in your organization. The <clears throat> essence of, a, of any capability is of course uh, the activity steps and a, and a capability is simply the exercise of a sequence of steps in a process. So here, here's a uh, kind of a, a, a compressed uh, schematic of, uh, uh, of a dynamic sensing capabilities. It says, let's figure out what the issues are, then map the zones of uncertainty. And uh, here's, a, here, here's a map uh, that uh, we put together. I, it's, uh, I can uh, share this because it's in the public domain. Many of these maps that I've created for my clients uh, are proprietary, uh, but this will give you a flavor of it. And uh, this was done, actually, uh, we, we built the first version eight years ago. And uh, uh, by a zone of uncertainty, I mean, we're not sure how this is gonna play out. Uh, and I could talk, uh, extensively. If I had a, another four hours, I could work my way through it. But these are the zones that we watch. But the one that I want to highlight is uh, climate change. So we started working, uh, and by we, I am the vice chair of the uh, think tank for Sonoma County Wine Growers. So my colleague, Carissa Cruz, uh, and I, um, with the executive committee, came up with this original formulation. Um, and, and it was no surprise here that climate change was the big, big problem for uh, the future um, and, and looking ahead 10 or 20 years. So um, it, it could be uh, disease. Uh, so as you have global warming, you get new and uh, devastating diseases, obviously weather effects, uh, flooding is a big issue. And uh, the one that we probably didn't see effectively was smoke. Um, and in fact, uh, the uh, Pinot Noir crop in Sonoma this year uh, was smoke tainted to the extent that we had to throw away 50% of the crop. Uh, it, it, it has been a devastating uh, year for Sonoma, uh, <clears throat> but it could have been worse. And uh, here's why. Uh, armed with this uh, analysis of all of the uh, elements of uh, uh, uncertainty, we, we focused on climate change and then how technology might help us, uh, big labor issues and so forth. And uh, we invested uh, and uh, extracted a commitment from the 1500 wine growers in Sonoma uh, that they would become 100% sustainable uh, in uh, uh, 2019. They achieved that first major wine growing area in the world to be 100% sustainable. And by sustainable, I mean the uh, totally uh, self-sufficient with respect to water, uh, they create catchment bays, basins, and uh, they do not draw any water from any other system. Uh, it has to do with electricity generation. They don't draw electricity from the grid. They, there's a number of standards with respect to treatment of labor, um, pesticides, runoff. So it's a very comprehensive set of certification standards. And uh, I'm, I'm so proud of what they've done in terms of getting to be 100% sustainable. And this has positioned them well to weather uh, climate change. And uh, the, the, the technology uh, is, is certainly helping. 
we are using a lot of sensors in order to understand the effect of climate change and uh, uh, in, in, in particular uh, geographic areas. Sonoma is a vast uh, wine growing region. And uh, so there's been a number of remediation efforts to help them address climate change uh, and, and, and be prepared for floods, weather, dramatic weather events and so forth. Uh, so that would be an example of uh, uh, a, a map of, of zones of uncertainty. Uh, but you can create your own. And uh, what I'm proposing here is that this is a way to help you deal with the tsunami wave of weak signals of changes in your uh, external environment. So these are the things we monitor, track, and uh, uh, try to manage as best we can. So any, any questions on how you might apply that to your own organization? I, I find it uh, a particularly effective tool and a way to communicate where the uncertainties are. And you'll notice that marketing uh, plays a critical role in understanding disruptions uh, beyond earthquakes, uh, changes in economics, uh, and regulatory practices. I but you can create a, uh, I've got lots of these, which I wish I could share with you. So, I find it striking that um, as you do, do those circles around the major change like climate change, that we don't list what we typically do in companies, which are functions. So we don't see finance and what technology might have been R&D, right, or HR. We don't see those. So we don't see marketing sitting here as a bubble on into itself. It's all bubbles, right? It's uh, Exactly. Very, These very, are... Yeah. That's a great question, Lynn. These are multifunctional bubbles of uncertainty. They're, they're zones, but the reason I call them zones is that uh, they're mostly external. And of course, that's where marketing uh, is so powerful uh, and effective at bringing the uncertainty into the organization. Uh, as you'll see under economics, channel power, competition are huge factors that have to be watched. But uh, your, your broader question is really important. This is a way for the leadership team to understand and focus their energies. And uh, in, in many organizations, they uh, share these widely so that they can alert the, uh, the, the key uh, customer facing and uh, peripheral, uh, the salespeople on the periphery to what we're looking at, because you can't look at everything, but these were judged to be the, the most critical um, and uh, potentially destructive elements of the environment or creating opportunities. So it is absolutely multifunctional and uh, marketing as a lead role in that. Okay, let's, uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, what we do next. Um, once we've got the interactions, then we can start to construct scenarios. So you'll see why uh, a, a scenario is an alternative plausible future. <clears throat> so we construct scenarios around climate change and uh, uh, so there's one uh, that uh, uh, is the, the extreme uncertainty over the rate of increase of temperatures. And, uh, uh, and there's another uncertainty around uh, what the consequences of uh, erratic weather are. Uh, and, and we have to be prepared for all those uncertainties these alternative uh, potential or plausible futures. So the, uh, the uh, 
uh, last step then is to figure out how to allocate leadership attention. And uh, then critically, you've got to share these widely. And uh, that goes back to your question, Lynn, that uh, there's got to be widespread aware awareness in throughout the organization. These are the things we're looking at. Uh, and then, and of course, you monitor them closely. This is what vigilant organizations do very well. So um, let me move on, and I got to be careful with the time here uh, and uh, address <clears throat> the question of where does marketing play uh, its biggest role? How, how does the uh, marketing function and marketing mindset uh, contribute to vigilance? So I'm going to look at uh, uh, both uh, what the situation is mm -hmm. and uh, talk about different uh, flavors of marketing leaders and then uh, wrap up with the uh, uh, priorities for marketing leaders in order to achieve marketing excellence. But I'll principally be looking at marketing as a general management responsibility. That is to keep the uh, organization in tune with a rapidly changing and uncertain environment. Uh, so what's the situation? <clears throat> no surprise. Uh, there's uh, a lot of new capabilities that uh, we have to master. Uh, uh, you, you could uh, envision making uh, XAAS is a, is a play on software as a service. Uh, so this is digital capabilities for offering new services. Um, we're all struggling with the uh, future of work. And uh, what I've really been interested in, in with the clients I'm working with is that uh, there's a real sense that this was uh, enabling a major shift, in, particularly in uh, the role of sales teams uh, uh, working remotely uh, during the pandemic. Uh, meant that sales teams could not go out and visit their customers. Well, it turns out, uh, and, and no surprise uh, to any of you, the customers actually uh, appreciate uh, some reduction in visits, but it's also enabled the sales teams to become much more efficient. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I, I, going forward, the... Uh, it, it'll be like going back to the office, uh, except we're talking about going back on the road. Uh, we, we've talked about the bottom left corner uh, that uh, we're going to have to build in much more resilience into our systems, uh, especially supply chains. Uh, we, we've got to learn how to uh, uh, bring back some parts of it. Uh, diversify our sources of supply, build in buffers, uh, because a highly optimized, more is better system is simply not sustainable. And then the whole ecosystem is changing. Uh, so these all work together. Uh, we're, we're finding uh, organizations are expanding their capabilities by entering into partnerships. Uh, and, and the reference to co-optition really has to do with the fact that uh, many of the times you will be both competing and collaborating with the, with the company. So those are some of the, uh, the big trends shaping marketing. Um, I, I don't think any of these uh, are particularly surprising, but what's happening is that uh, they're interacting and all coming together at the same time. And vigilant organizations will be better prepared and excellent marketing organizations will be uh, able to take these and take advantage of them. Uh, so let, let's see if uh, any questions on this. Uh, 
I wouldn't expect there are any surprises here. Not seeing any. Okay. Wait, hang on. What, what role does open innovation play? Uh, so <clears throat> I consider it uh, both uh, so I'm, I'm oh, actually, as I'm thinking through, that's a great question uh, because it does exploit digital advances. Um, by open innovation, I'm going to use the conventional uh, uh, Henry Chesick uh, uh, definition of open, which is you do a lot of partnering and uh, as opposed to closed innovation where you do everything in-house. Uh, and I think every one of these trends uh, accelerates open innovation uh, because I, a highly optimized innovation system, but I'm going down to the bottom left-hand corner here, is, uh, is more brutal. Uh, whereas in an open innovation uh, system, it's bringing in many more resources and I think will will ultimately be more resilient. It can pivot faster. Uh, and, and of course, open innovation depends on creating partnerships, bringing in design uh, partners or bringing in manufacturing partners. You don't have to control them, uh, but it's very much a case of you uh, in, invest perhaps in them, uh, but there's a potential for uh, joint ventures. So. Uh, open innovation is enabled by all of these, uh, and, and I think will accelerate as each of these four big trends uh, shapes uh, the, the future of innovation. Great question. Thank you. Yeah, I don't any, see it any other questions? I, I love the, uh, the, the, the questions because they uh, help I, I thank every one of us to understand these better. Okay, in the interest of time, let me uh, uh, move to the question of what role for marketing. And uh, so let me explain why I'm doing this at this stage, because there are marketing leaders and there are marketing leaders. Um, and, and so what I'm going to ask you to do uh, is uh, check as many boxes as apply to your marketing leader um, that could be the CMO, the uh, director of communications or everything in between. Um, is that person a trusted advisor? So just l let me explain further. Um, I've, I've set this uh, uh, screen with the, uh, the, the fundamental uh, activities of the marketing leader as being chief core communicator and steward of the brand asset. This will be true of all marketing leaders. What happens though uh, <coughs> is that uh, the uh, most influential marketing leaders are trusted advisor to the, C to the CEO. They're part of the leadership team. And uh, my vision of the leadership team is that uh, they are help, helping and working with the CEO. Uh, they're subordinating their functional responsibilities, although they take that skill set in the knowledge base and uh, they are crafting and uh, developing strategy with the CEO as a partner and uh, deciding on resource allocation. So these are the people that uh, have the, uh, the, the CMO title, but they're the, they have a seat at the table. Um, could be the single point of contact, catalyzer of top line growth, and that is, are they responsible for organic growth? Mm -hmm. And not, not growth through acquisitions necessarily, but organic growth done with your own resources. Uh, and, and that means a uh, critical partner 
and maybe the driver of the innovation process, um, integrator, and, and so forth. You're, <clears throat> you can see uh, that uh, each of these is a, uh, a, a critical activity and uh, a responsibility for the marketing leader, or could be. Now, uh, now that you've got a sense of what's going on here, uh, I, I, I did this for a really interesting client. I, I wish I could tell you who they were, uh, but they have a lot of marketing and salespeople. And uh, they're, they're, they're basically in the enterprise software uh, and uh, cloud computing space. Uh, you, know, you can use your creativity there. But what they were discovering is that their marketing and salespeople <clears throat> were uh, focused on talking with and understanding the chief technology, or the, the chief IT person or the, the head of technology. That was where they had their relationships. But they were finding, uh, this was about three years ago, that uh, marketing actually had a bigger IT budget than the head of IT, uh, particularly in uh, B2C companies. And then they realized that they had really very little understanding of the chief marketing officer. And uh, so my job was to create a MOOC, a massive open online course for all their marketing and salespeople to help them understand better uh, who they were talking with, <clears throat> what their incentives were, how they were evaluated, what their responsibilities were. And this was at a time when uh, the, uh, the, the job of the CMO was particularly perilous, uh, although it hasn't improved dramatically. Uh, the, the turnover rate among CMOs is still pretty high. Uh, but this was a scoring uh, uh, that we gave a, a scoring tool that we gave to their uh, customer contact people in order to understand uh, where the key people, the, the, the marketing leader fit in the organization. And so here are just some of the titles that they had to deal with, uh, but, um, and, and I've arrayed them from uh, most influential generally to least influential. The uh, issue here is, okay, what are uh, their, their points of influence? What are their responsibilities? How do we understand them better so we can sell to them? And uh, so we took that uh, scoring tool and uh, classified marketing leaders um, by whether they were a top line leader, uh, a market advocate, with a score of four to six, or simply a uh, sales support or service resource, uh, which are important functions. But uh, the, the, the issue here is how influential is the marketing leader in uh, uh, being a major player in the C-suite so they can contribute to, uh, to enhancing the overall vigilance capabilities of the organization. Uh, but before I get too much further, uh, love to get your thoughts, reactions, and uh, feedback on this. Yeah, so Scott says, you know, broadly speaking, corporate vigilance appears to be driven by company culture and behavior. How you do something versus what you do, kind of those kinds of skills. So how critical is it for the company culture to enable B2B marketers or, even more important, how can B2B marketers influence the culture? Uh, so culture is the, uh, the, the values and beliefs uh, that, that define how we go about our jobs, uh, accepting responsibilities. But uh, I'm following uh, uh, John Cotter's work. He's one of the uh, preeminent uh, analysts uh, and, and scholars uh, and, and think thought leaders on uh, culture change. And his argument, which I find quite compelling, is that uh, you can't change a culture directly, 
but you have to change the enabling conditions. So uh, let me back up to this chart. And uh, so our view on culture change, and, and this certainly applies to the role of marketing in the organization, is that it's played out through the leadership demonstrating uh, their commitment to vigilance. For, for example, take curiosity. Uh, Jeff Bezos uh, nurtures curiosity as a high value uh, as a high value element of their culture. And uh, so if you're not curious, you're not really a player. And uh, so that's a value and, and literally a mindset. Another aspect of the culture here, uh, which we uh, can address directly is learning from disappointments. Uh, and, and so you, uh, a change process that uh, aims to achieve the, the, the factors on the right-hand side, uh, then will inevitably uh, change the culture as people see, okay, we, uh, we, we did a much wider angle scanning, we were better prepared and uh, we could act faster. And uh, that gets taken on board and embedded in the culture. So uh, just to reiterate, I don't see culture as being something that we can address directly, but it's a consequence of making moves uh, effective moves uh, and uh, uh, being more customer centric uh, is, is certainly part of that. So does that help uh, uh, clarify what I have in mind here? I'm going to say yes. Yes, yes, George, okay. yes, thanks. Um, so love to get your thoughts on uh, uh, the role of the marketing leader <clears throat> as a key player in, uh, uh, as we just discussed, shaping the culture and preparing the organization for uh, uh, an era of greater turbulence. Does anybody want to... Uh, uh, put forth a, an analysis of their own organization? So and remember, this was designed to help us under, help my client understand better the job of the uh, head of marketing, the marketing leader. I would, I would offer to turn off the recording if that would help. That's a good idea, yeah. Well, you don't have to identify it. It's just, uh, I'd love to get some thoughts on uh, how influential marketing is because uh, the, the key point here is that uh, uh, if you're the voice of the customer, a market advocate and an integrator of digital technology, you've got a lot more influence than if you're just uh, serving as a service resource uh, and uh, creating market insights. So this goes back to the question of uh, not only do you need a, uh, a really effective market insights function, but you have to have uh, the necessary credibility in the organization to get the other functions to pay attention to the market insights. So one of the things I would do observationally is let you know that, you know, we have a wide um, range of companies as members and often our, the, the, the first um, time members join with us, they're starting at a lower level of this. They're starting mm -hmm. maybe in the service resource level where the reason they've joined ISBM is because they need some of the tools and the processes and the insight skills to yeah. get to market advocate. And then of course we have companies that probably are in the top line leader. I can think of a few that are now, you know, running with the latest capabilities um, and driving growth, but it's a, it's a journey to get there. 
Yep, it is a journey. And <clears throat> one of the motivations, uh, surely, uh, in uh, all of your partner companies, and uh, I'd love to get some thoughts, is what is the, uh, what is the major competitor doing? Because if they move towards uh, uh, the role of the marketing leader being a top line leader, they'll be much better prepared. And so it goes back to this distinction between vigilant and vulnerable organizations. By and large, uh, vigilant organizations have either uh, a, a strong market advocate or even better, uh, marketing is the top line leader. And uh, by owning the customer value proposition, they can shape the innovation and, uh, uh, and, and by driving top line organic growth, they can uh, uh, shape the R&D function, uh, their priorities, uh, make investments in information technology. So they've got a lot more uh, influence in the organization. Another observation we have is that it seems like this is actually a pendulum swing for many companies. They, they bring it, they realize they need to do better in, in all the marketing functions and they need better insights. So they hire uh, top people, they put strategies together, they begin to execute, then something happens and they decide that's a big spend, let's cut there. Yeah. And, uh, and then they kind of stall or even worse regress a bit and then they come back again. And uh, so any ideas on how to prevent the pendulum swinging? Uh, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, and it does uh, speak to uh, something that really concerns me is the high rate of turnover uh, among uh, marketing leaders and CMOs in particular. Uh, we were looking at uh, the average tenure. Uh, and now I, I'm not sure if I can distinguish uh, call out the B2B versus B2C or a joint um, turnover rate, but it was somewhere, uh, the, the average job tenure would be about three years, which doesn't give you a lot of time to uh, understand, execute the uh, changes in the customer value proposition and prepare the organization. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that pendulum swing is uh, pretty lethal. <laughs> yeah, I think we, we see that regularly. Um, it's a, probably another good reason to, that to be part of the ISBM network. But yeah. part of the, uh, the, the, the problem is things are moving so fast. Uh, even to be an integrator of digital technologies um, is, is quite a challenge because there's so much coming at you. Um, and uh, so if you're in react mode, that is reacting to what your competitors are doing, you're never going to catch up and get an advantage. So a lot of this is a function of uh, what uh, the dynamics are of the market and of what your key competitors are doing. Because if they're uh, in investing heavily in digital technologies ahead of you, uh, you're gonna have a struggle catching up. So uh, I, I think, uh, let me finish up uh, and then uh, see if there's any questions by looking ahead to uh, a bit, and building on that question and uh, asking the question, uh, what should the, uh, the priorities then be for the marketing leader uh, to really help the organization become more vigilant. <clears throat> and the, the first step is, of course, to build out the, uh, the vigilant market learning or market insight function. And uh, so back to the uh, first question, I think that we had, uh, market insights are crucial. By market, I mean not only customer, but channel and competitor. Uh, by ambidexterity, I mean, you, you've got to be able to simultaneously manage in the present, and, and you may have a, a separate organization. For example, the Market Insights uh, organization 
is really future oriented uh, or, or, or it should be. And by ambidexterity, I mean, you got part of the organization is executing on the current strategies and uh, capabilities and the uh, vigilant market learning is to create the new sensing capabilities. Uh, <clears throat> the second big priority is uh, to cultivate empathy throughout the organization. This is uh, another way of thinking about market orientation. That is standing in the shoes of your customers and thinking like them and trying to anticipate where they're going to be next and uh, asking whether they're going to be, uh, uh, what, what new requirements they're going to have or how we can help them solve their problems better. It, it means uh, certainly nurturing collective curiosity. Um, the, the third big priority, and uh, this, this could be a, a whole topic in itself, is how to uh, get a better integration between IT, marketing, and the, uh, the, the partners, uh, the channel partners and open innovation partners. Lastly, I'm uh, sorry, fourth, I'm seeing a evolution towards a more of a commercial function where uh, <clears throat> we don't have so much of the uh, uh, Mars and Venus uh, uh, juxtaposition of sales and marketing. The, uh, the, there is a commercial director or uh, chief marketing officer who has both of these functions. Because sales teams, particularly uh, when they're selling uh, big ticket items and uh, are orchestrating multi-level selling, have a huge responsibility to shape the strategy because they're on the front line delivering solutions. So if you're a medical uh, diagnostic Im imaging equipment maker, you have to be able to uh, sell an integrated solution. And, and that's uh, uh, really a function of being able to understand all aspects of the customer's requirements, say the hospital uh, who's buying the equipment, as well as creating uh, the, the kind of information flow. So I see, uh, in, in particularly in those situations, with complex B2B uh, uh, sales, big ticket sales, there's much more likely to be a commercial function. And then finally, I don't see any scenario of the future where marketing is not going to be judged uh, and, and uh, taken uh, responsibility for performance enhancements. Uh, their, their investments have to be demonstrably uh, good investments for the organization. So these are uh, <clears throat> probably generally familiar. Uh, I'm uh, prescriptions, but I'm reframing them as uh, uh, essential to achieving marketing excellence and uh, particularly serving the organization through, um, and I'm going to endorse again with the title of my book by seeing sooner and then acting faster. So uh, that's kind of the, uh, the sum up. I'd love to get any final questions that you might have. Yep, so feel free to type in the chat window or go ahead and just open up your mute and um, turn off mute and go ahead and speak. I'll give it a second. I had one that queued up. I'll wait for anyone who wants to type. Um, but uh, you know, some some folks have mentioned uh, another book. So maybe just a plug for someone else's, which I'm now going to go get and read. Um, recently, Rakesh Natin and Jerry Wind, who you know, um, have written a book called Transformation in Times of Crisis. And yeah. out of one of the pages, they have this lovely list 
of things that you could do to create opportunities in times of crisis. Oh, that it would have been nice to have this last January, but I have it now, right? Mm -hmm. And I think some of these principles really uh, resonate with the things that you've just said. So I'm gonna just read through them for you. And if you wanna then George comment on that afterward, that'd be great. So let me just read these, these eight principles, right? First is to challenge your mental models and stay ahead. Well, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yes. Principle two, reimagine and reinvent your approach to customers and stakeholders. Principle three, speed up the digital transformation and design for personalization at scale. Principle four, reinvent your talent strategy and embrace open innovation and open talent. Principle five, seeds the need for speed and design for agility, adjacencies, and adaptability. Principle six, innovate, then experiment, experiment, experiment. That's actually my fun one. Principle seven, redraw, redraw your timelines. Build a portfolio of initiatives across all innovation horizons. And principle eight, deploy idealized design recreate your organizational architecture and network orchestration. What are your thoughts on this, George? <laughs> so, I, I love that list. Uh, I'm actually very familiar with it. <clears throat> and I've learned a lot from uh, Jerry Wynn over the years, because uh, we're close colleagues, uh, good friends. And uh, so I'm uh, looking at his list, which I I have read the book. Uh, I've heard them uh, give their uh, multiple talks on this. And uh, these are uh, literally another way of thinking about the same issue I'm looking at. Um, so they're, they're literally two sides of the same coin. There's uh, very much uh, a, a close mapping. We could take each of the principles you described and uh, map them into the four elements of a vigilant organization. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the difference is that we're looking at uh, some of the more fundamental elements of vigilant organizations. And uh, uh, for example, uh, focusing more on the role of leadership in making these principles uh, activating these principles, making them a priority and allocating resources to them. Uh, so our perspective is literally uh, closely uh, aligned, it's complementary, but we're asking a slightly different question. How do you build an organization to actually deliver these eight principles that yeah. will create opportunities? Yeah. And, and we're also, uh, uh, although I didn't get into it a lot, uh, we're looking at uh, threats uh, and, and anticipating threats and trying to learn to deal with them. Uh, but we've also, one of the things I haven't talked about is uh, there are a lot of opportunities and threats within organizations. So the internal uh, opportunity might be uh, for example, I, I remember uh, uh, working with J and J, and they had. Uh, I mean, this is public. That uh, they had very little idea what other people in the organization were doing that might bring innovations that they could apply. Uh, so there's a lot more information sharing in in that organization, but uh, the uh, <coughs> other focus. Uh, that we bring is much more of the organizational capability because uh, they uh, a, a lot of these uh, principles bear on the, uh, the the innovation capability and uh, we would call that uh, uh, much more investing in foresight and uh, an innovation but highly complementary uh, and, and and they they work uh, beautifully together yeah, thanks. Well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna just leap on that uh, capability mention, um, and and uh, if you don't mind, George, I'll 
want to share my screen and a few other slides, but hang with me because uh, people will still be chatting and if more questions come up, we're gonna pull you back in. But if uh, you'll let me share by stop sharing. Um, yeah, let me uh, drop out of mine. Thank you. All right, now I'll share mine again. That is a really nice picture of you, George, by the way. So, Thank you. Well, I'll come back to this later so everybody can have our email addresses if they need to get up with us. But I just wanted to talk about something that we, um, we began uh, last year and we've been running two pilots with two of our member companies. And this is a free tool to our members. So if you're a member, um, you can take our mastery assessment. So, so there, there is a series of questions that really builds on the basic capabilities and then talks about um, a bit of the um, capabilities across the organization that support the functions that George has been describing. But this is really um, a bit of table stakes. You know, you, you have to have some of these things in order to even exist well or, or maintain your position, but to grow, to, to, to advance against your competition, you'll also need some of these others. So it, it's a survey that your organization can take. It's not limited to marketing, as George would say. He, you, you've got to look across the organization. It can't just all be marketing's job. So you would include other functions in the organization to do the assessment. And then one of the things that is the best part of all of this is that as you bring back the opinions from everyone in the organization about how well you're doing things, you have dialogue about the areas where there's large enough gaps that it, it's worth taking an effort to close them. So as we talked about, you know, how do we get our organization to do X? Well, it helps if everybody thinks they might need to do it. And this is one way to maybe get people on board to do that. So um, if you're interested in that, please reach out to myself, Lynn or Rand, um, and let us know. We'll get you in the queue for doing the assessment. Uh, the other thing- hey, Lynn, we're not seeing your right slide. You're, we still only see the first page of your um, slide deck. Let me do that again. Let me try that. Thank you. I, that was no fun, was it? And here, let me see if, uh, does that look better? There you go. You're better. Sorry. Okay. So it's, it was a nice little picture. The story was the best part. But because um, I don't show you exactly what the, the, the tool that you'll use is a Google Doc survey that everybody can take and you know, you'll want to get enough data from enough people answering the questions. But frankly, again, if you're interested just in doing this assessment to see how, how um, far you are from where you could be and the gaps that you might want to fill and you wanna also build that database so you can drive that change, reach out to us, please. Okay, so now I'm gonna advance that and you'll tell me if I, you see it, Lori. Uh, yes? Yep. Yes, you're good. All right. So, um, so Rand, are you with us? Do you want to talk about the track? Yeah, real quickly um, summarize. We we do have a very unique uh, opportunity in the way that we have scheduled our on our um, virtual courses this year, uh, starting in April with three workshops from Dr. Bob Thomas, followed in uh, in uh, followed up by VOC workshops with. Jerry Katz, um, and then uh, a competitive deep dive competitive analysis workshop and a marketing deep dive market analysis workshop with Dr. Liam Fahey, and finally wrapping up with the concept of value and developing winning value propositions with, uh, with Dr. Ralph Oliva. So uh, this opportunity to take these workshops from the period of April through September is what we call our B2B mastery track. Um, we have gotten quite a few people to sign up for the track as well as uh, some people signing up for the individual workshops, uh, which you can do um, both on either of which you can do on isbm.com. We do heavily discount um, the, if you sign up for the entire track series, as you can see on that slide previously, um, and then finally, uh, you can see that the, um, go ahead to the calendar, Lynn. You can see that the way these are scheduled there, they aren't, it will not overwhelm you, but it will give you in the span of six months, a comprehensive graduate level 
uh, be, uh, study and understanding of B2B marketing from the world's best B2B uh, marketing instructors. So um, we, while we have a, a good number of people who have signed up, we have not reached our limit yet of 15 people per class. So, uh, which we would love to meet because meet, that would be an ideal class size. Um, but so we'd encourage you to take a look at that, give me a call or an email and uh, think about your new marketers, your existing marketers who are still in their development phase. And also we've had a couple people sign up who are in digital marketing or Marcom who recognize they need to understand core strategic marketing so they can be better in their highly specialized function. Thank you, Lynn. Great, great. Okay, so let me uh, just reach back. I'm gonna go back and uh, check, check out the chat window. I've got too many things open here. Um, make sure that if folks have more questions, um, I would love to hear from you. So uh, let me just open the window and see what else is up. Yeah, so, so Gary Lillian shares that there's lots of routes to enlightenment and growth. Um, and what the key there, right, Gary, is to get on the route to the enlightenment, right? Don't just sit off up to the side and watch people walk by you. So absolutely, right. Anyone else to have questions and we'll be happy to open the mics if you'd like to talk directly. Um, your opportunity to ask questions directly of these of our folks is really important. To, and of course, you will think of something after we say goodbye. So let me go back to that slide here and just show you that if you want to follow up with us, you can send George an email. You can send an email to Rand or uh, me, Lynn or Scott or Becky. You'll find everybody for ISBM right on ISBM.com and you can do the contact us. It comes into us, we'll see it. But you can also follow up with George. All right, I'm not, uh, I'm not seeing any other inputs and I do appreciate uh, you joining us for this jam session. I learned so much and I, I now feel like I'm super motivated to make some changes. So I hope you all are too. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Do remember to go to isbm.com and sign up for those other things and uh, have a really great rest of your afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.